Tuma Milar. I know him actually for quite some time. Tuma has been uh, doing his doctorate over here at ETH Zurich in the team of Didier Sonnet. So he's back in his alma mater. He's already tweeted this morning about this, uh, that he is excited to be back. I'm very excited too. Uh, we also have organized a hackathon together in San Francisco about uh, earthquake resilience, participatory resilience. And this was a very interesting experience to me because I saw how much can be accomplished within just um, 24, no, 48 hours, I guess. So about two days, there were quite a few doses of people participating and a number of interesting projects, three of them got uh, awarded and I'm still sometimes giving talks remembering basically those times and also the outcomes of that hackathon. And since then, actually, uh, we've been both engaged towards more participatory approaches in science and society, for example, there is the Citizen Science Competence Center between UZETA and ETH that I'm a member of. And Toma is uh, running Open Geneva, and I guess he will maybe say a few words in the beginning to give you an idea about what he is doing over there. Uh, we are heading towards expanding that concept of uh, a participatory digital society towards city Olympics. I mean, competitions between cities for solutions to our world's problems, involving and engaging citizens and all the other stakeholders of society, but activating the power of ideas and the talents of the people in these formats. Today, however, Thomas will not talk about this, but he will talk about another very timely and important subject, which is cyber security. And I'm sure there's a lot to discuss too. Welcome very much, Thomas. The floor is yours. Thank you. Dear. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I, as I was told I got so 60 minutes, so I packed up a lot of slides though in a rush so forgive me if there are like some some typos or some issues i want to say thank you to dirk for inviting me and Trump for for inviting me to eth zurich i graduated in 2011 uh, uh, went for a postdoc actually at the center for law and economics in this building for two years and then went to with stefan bestholm and then i went for three years and a half to uc berkeley and then i returned to University of Geneva, where my wife got a faculty position, you know, a two body problem in, in research. And um, um, I got to work on a, um, an initiative, which, which is a partnership between the University of Geneva and the University of uh, Tsinghua in uh, China, which is the Chinese MIT, uh, just uh, climbing up the, the rankings at, uh, at the speed, light speed in a way. And uh, this partnership is about like the practical implementation of the sustainable development goals of the United Nations and the goal is really to go for at home innovation so instead of thinking like you know with the United Nations and international organizations thinking like oh what kind of new policy we should invent it's more about like what kind of innovation can really make the world a better place and part of this uh, this engagement is really to organize what we call Open Geneva it's a festival of innovation in, uh, in Geneva and uh, this year was uh, 31 hackathons all over the city, 800 participants, which makes us virtually one of the biggest uh, innovation events in, in Europe, probably bigger than Hike Zurich. But the nice thing is that we make it very nice for, for everyone. It's not competitive at all. And we welcome all kinds of participation. So we are like humanitarian organizations, organized hackathons, the, the, the University Hospital, uh, the University of Geneva, the CERN, uh, the United Nations uh, uh, Library, all these kind of, uh, of institutions that are in Geneva are just like playing the game of uh, participatory innovation for a better world. And uh, so it's a different format than we running that. And so uh, Dirk was talking about that because uh, there's this idea that cities should be involved in uh, making change happen, but in a way that is really democratized, that everyone should be part of, the, of this change. So hackathon is a good format for that. So 
Now, uh, the reason why I'm going to talk about the topic which is not my, my main duty is actually when I started my PhD at ETH Zurich, I wanted to work on cyber risks and there was no funding for that. And the reason, uh, the, so I got funding for studying open source software development and open innovation. And this gave rise to this research and, uh, and uh, track to, to hackathons and open innovation. But still I have like this baby of uh, my love, which is cyber security and cyber risk. And I want to tell you the three latest developments of my research on this topic. Uh, it's very off the track. Uh, I don't know if there are some cybersecurity experts here in the in the room. Um, if yes, you might be surprised by the what I'm going to talk about, and uh, I hope you would be it would be the case. Um, if you don't understand, uh, it's going to be a lot of slides. So if you have like short clarification questions, please uh, um, uh, ask them. But uh, on the, otherwise, we can have a discussion at the end of the of the talk. Is that okay for you? Yeah. So. The talk is uh, also, I was not really aware it was a seminar, I thought it was the, it was the group meeting of, uh, of DX group. Uh, so I thought we, we would have like a, um, you know, an exploration uh, of the results. And so uh, there's no problem if you see any controversy, any problem, any, any question, any discussion, any comment you want to make to this research. I'm very glad to get, uh, to get uh, constructive feedback. And, uh, constructive feedback it does not necessarily come only from professor, but also from students. So I'm very glad if you if you come with pertinent questions. So the the point I want to make, and you will see along the talk, is that actually what is one of the main limitations of cybersecurity is human cognition. Actually, it was one of the first reasons uh, for lack of security and on, on the internet. But now, as time goes, we we realize that. A lot of has to do with the with human cognition and its limitations, and I want to show you that with two two papers that are an example, uh, two examples of this, and uh, one which is more like an in-depth experiment of how people deal with uh, um, hard and abstract problems. Um, why I say that uh, I say new, but actually it's the oldest because the first cybersecurity attacks were performed what is what is called social engineering. <coughs> So it means that there was not even a problem of technical aspects, it was more of like manipulati manipulating the mind of people. And um, that was the f there, were, there, was the, the, there were the first attacks and, uh, on, the, on the internet. So it's new because there's a new way of thinking of these problems as a community problem. But actually manipulating the mind has always been one of the key features of, uh, of cyber attacks. So let me start with a uh, short introduction. Uh, it's been long already, but it's make a sort of an analogy about like uh, between cybersecurity resilience and climate change. There are two pro there are two um, uh, complex uh, or extreme risks that are evolving in a in a fast manner. I mean, we can't think of finance, but it's a bit more complicated. Climate change is nice because we understand we all get to the point that okay, the sea level is rising. Uh, this is going to trigger more and more uh, fluids. And actually, after some time, these floods will become like these places, the places that are flooded now in a few decades, there will be the places where there will be permanent water. So question is, so we see um, hurricane after hurricane that these places are, are the ones that are the most, uh, the, most, uh, the most weak, the weakest, they're going to be, to be permanently um, uh, um, invaded by water. So it's, climate change is really a rising danger. But also there's defense adaptation. I mean, most cities, at least the richest, they have like they have undergone uh, major engineering plans to to make the city resilient, uh, resilient to to the problem of uh, climate change and uh, sea water uh, rise. Now the question is like, is it going to be enough or not? Uh, what we, what's going to happen? I just like to to set, to tell this story that resilience is uh, is everywhere and should be also in cybersecurity. So I want just to show uh, very old research, but it was showing uh, like a principle of cybersecurity resilience. And it's very schematic, but as you understand, actually over time you get new vulnerabilities and these vulnerabilities, they are going to um, have some, some uh, expose some computers, maybe yours, maybe the one of companies and so on. Depends on the software you're running, uh, the situation you're in, what kind of uh, malware you have on your computer, 
what kind of malware you don't have on your computer and so on and so forth. But each time there's an exploit, there's the, there's a danger, and it's going to grow as a step a step function as a function of the number of computer um, or hosts that are that are going to. Have. Of course, people are not just saying just doing nothing. We get reaction from software developer, from people, from companies, and they're going to deploy some patches with some delay. And the, the point I want to make is that like if we if we look at these patch deployments and their dynamics, which was the, the, the aim of this first pa pa second paper in cybersecurity idea, is that you, 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 see, you can see the timeline of vulnerability host over time. It's like nothing, then you have a spike, and then there's a reduction, then you get another spike, then you have a reduction, a decay, and so on and so forth. But over time, it's growing. The reason is that the decay is, uh, is, uh, is a power law function, T as a power um, alpha, my T as a power minus alpha, but alpha smaller than one means that over time many hosts never get, never get, uh, or very, it's very unlikely they're going to get patched. So over time you'll get an exponential growth of the number of unpatched and unsecured systems. So the, uh, uh, the, it's very interesting here because you see that people are taking action, the industry is taking action to, to reduce the problem of cybersecurity. So this is resilience, cyber, cyber attacks. But at the same time, there are like a lot of blind spots that cannot be addressed. And this is fueling sort of like a, a, an underlying risk that is going to be, that might blow up at some point uh, in our face. So I don't, Dirk told me that I should not be too, too glo gloomy during the, during the talk, try to keep hope. So I hope now I've not depressed you. Now I want to finish this uh, introduction by saying that there is a question of also uh, humans with technical empowerment can be good, it can be bad, but the thing is that like cyber criminals and cyber and cyber security officers face each other like superheroes empowered with huge technology technological leverage. They can use the, their tools, their software to either defend or to attack. And uh, but they remain human beings. They are going to. They are the people who are steering the technology behind their behind uh, behind the scenes sort of and uh, their behavior is core to cyber risks so i don't know if you are, if i get it uh, i really pass the message very clear it's like it's not because you have a firewall in your company that your company is safe it's because you have like someone who is managing the side the firewall or the ids or the anti anti antivirus managing security policies and so on and all these people are humans there is this discourse in cyber security that technology is all but actually Technology is a sort of an exoskeleton, but what counts is the human mind behind. And I want to really show this, uh, uh, this in, uh, in my talk. So the talk outline is three selected topics. So there will be two papers that are um, submitted or published in, uh, in, uh, in the field of cybersecurity. One, the first one is about like designing organizations for cybersecurity resilience. So it's a bit more broad scope. The second one is going to, to be about like bug bounty programs, which is a very nice way to expose the incentives of people and also the difficulties of people who are hunting bugs in the software. And the third one is an experiment that, uh, that a friend of mine has done at Columbia University of uh, all humans try to tackle or manage to tackle hard and abstract problems, which is typically the problems that we see in cybersecurity, but not only, it can be also for policy making or other things. So, before I start, uh, is there any questions so far? Uh, who is lost already? No? Who is sleeping already? Well, those who sleep won't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should ask me a question. Is there any questions so far? No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. QR code, if you want to download the paper, you can, uh, you can scan the QR code and. Uh, and, um, and get the paper at the same time. So part one is designing organization for cybersecurity resilience. The opportunity here is that when you have a security operations center in a company, most of the big companies are like UBS, Credit Suisse, they're just managing tickets, security tickets. Um, this report of incidents, they are of course timestamps, you know when they happen, you know when they're open, when who did what, and when they get closed. And actually, many organizations, they get also the effort. So they will just say, how many hours 
people, uh, security engineers or security officers are going to deal with this, uh, with this, this security incident. And there are a lot, actually. Why is it, is it an opportunity? Well, first of all, it's an opportunity because this kind of data are extremely hard to get. Um, we got extremely lucky to get to get some data from a from a, a large uh, U.S. organization, which I'm not allowed to say the name. But if I would say the name, you would just uh, think that I'm a, like a data data guru wizard. And so I would just like uh, double the, the impact of my talk just by saying this name, just, just to shut up. But the there's a the nice thing with this ticketing system is that the, the effort that you can record from this and encapsulate information on the technical difficulty of incidents, the human capabilities of people uh, that are dealing with these this is issues, that can be intelligence, education, experience, and learning capabilities, and so the group coordination capabilities, but we are not going to cover that today, unfortunately, because it's a seminar on computational social science. So this large organization, we got data from over six to six for in three years, um, and there was 60,767 cybersecurity incidents. For each of these events, we got most of these events, we got the effective time spent on resolution in hours. So we, we don't know who did uh, the resolution, but we know how many hours. It's like, is it half an hour, one hour, 10 hours, one month? This is the kind of uh, data we got. We also got some categories where there was a, a spillage of sensitive information disclosure, a task, patching exercise, uh, investigation, a stolen laptop or a tablet or phone, or an email, or a, a malware, or a website, uh, exploit, like a, a phishing attack and so on. And we can also see how this has evolved over time uh, with this simple, uh, simple uh, timeline. So I think, I hope all these kind of attacks, it doesn't really matter much, but I hope all these kind of attacks, uh, you, you ro roughly understand what it is about. Like you, lo you lost your iPhone, they are sensitive on this, on your iPhone, uh, it's not been encrypted, sorry for you, all your address book is, uh, is gone and someone is going to start spamming with, uh, with this. And malware is like a, a website is, uh, well, you got an email, say, hey, just fill this form, whatever, uh, uh, send your password for, for your bank account, uh, sorry for you, it's going, someone is going to explore that, and so on and so forth. Now, there's a difference between risk and resilience. Uh, risk is really about like shocks that are given, that, uh, uh, that arrive with a given frequency and uh, with some costs. So you get, uh, you're a company, you're an organization, you're running a cyber security center, you're, you're aware of your security. What you're going to see is that every, every minute, every hour, you will get some cyber security incidents. They're just coming, it's like a flow. And, uh, and this is the risk. So most of the events, they're going to be very big, no problem. I mean, you just deal with them, maybe it's just monitoring and reporting and there's, no, there's nothing to do. You just see there, there, but there's no action to do. But some are going to take way, way more time. And this is the big thing. Resilience is really about like saying, okay, if you have like an event that is significant, how can I learn in order to absorb the shock? And if this event re repeats in the future, how can I make sure that this event is going to cost me less than uh, the, initial, the initial shock. So the idea is that in the end, as you get the same event, the same kind of event repeating, that is going to cost less and less because you learn something. And this is resilience, at least in this context. So this organization, which is actually very security aware, what we could see is that actually they could manage, manage the absorption, shock absor absorption with, at, a, at a pace which was Amazing. So it means that at the beginning they would just not be that good, or uh, maybe they were just aligning with the attacks that were that were going on. But with time, we could see that uh, the capacity to absorb shocks grew in a, with a power of um, a function with a finite time singularity. I mean, this is a this is a technical detail, but the idea is that it grows extremely fast. After that, you can have a, a phase transition or whatever, but it doesn't really matter. What matters is that this organization has been able to absorb more and more shocks over time, which is extremely positive. Um, um, this shock absorption, in turn, um, I mean, the question is like, where does it come from? Where does it come from? I mean, at some point you get to have like that many human resources. So say, let's say three people uh, over 24 hours, it can be 
uh, uh, you know, running. They're, 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 they're monitoring 24 hours a day. So it means that maybe instead of three, you have like 10 people in total, but they're just like, they're just rolling and they're taking care of the security of the, of the, the organization. Now, assuming that uh, this workforce has remained constant over the six years, how is it possible that this organization could absorb more and more shocks? And uh, what we found is that actually, um, this organization has been capable of reducing drastically the most extreme events. There were some events that would take months to, to, to solve, let's say. I don't know if you're aware of this uh, attack, what's called Earth Bleed. It was uh, two years ago, or three years ago, and it was really an attack on the um, SSL uh, encryption uh, protocol. And um, a friend of mine was a security officer at Square, the payment, uh, the, uh, the, yeah, the mobile payment company, which is not really present in Switzerland. It's like Twint, but like an American version, just much bigger. They, it took them one week uh, with 10 engineers to, to tackle the problem of early. No problem, there are no, there are no incident in the sense that there was no security issue, there was no attack. But it took them one week to solve the problem with 10 seasoned engineers just to address the, the issue of early. And it gives you a sense of like how fast it can go, how much time it can take to solve a, an extreme event like this. And this organization has been very good at reducing these uh, extreme events. So they just made it, made this, uh, this extreme event less and le less, and less uh, frequent. And then this time they could spare made them capable of uh, absorbing more shocks. So very, very, a very nice virtuous circle. I think it's I'm, I'm not aware of much research that I've shown empirically how an organization can learn like this um, in a way that we can measure it. So the reduction of uh, extreme, of the high percentage in terms of, uh, of effort has been exponential. So we can also see the, the half-life decay. Uh, means that for the 99.99th percentile, it, uh, the half-life was two months. So every two months, the reduction would be half. Uh, the, the number of the effort would be half. So extremely efficient. Um, so you can see also the, the distribution of the events over, over uh, 12 periods. So roughly six months per period. And you can see these distributions are heavy tail. So in log-log scale, you get a, it's like a parallel distribution. You get a straight line in log-log. In log-log means that it's a parallel distribution. And you can see over the period is just reducing. So at the one percent frequency, the impact was reduced by 40 times over the six years. And at the 0.1 frequency, the impact uh, was reduced by 600 times. So it means that actually they, uh, they, they, they really managed to reduce uh, this. I was talking about uh, technical exoskeletons. At some point, the humans, uh, the people, they are going to take decisions, but they are going to implement that with software in a way or another. And uh, a good example is uh, full disk encryption policy. This organization, before they, they implemented full disk encryption, they got uh, a laptop stolen. And because it's a very critical company organization, it took them six months to, to, manage, the, to manage the disaster. So, they, so at some point they say, okay, well, we cannot afford that anymore. Or I don't, we don't exactly do the details of the process, but at some point I say, okay, no, full disk encryption on every mobile device, like a laptop, like a mobile phone. And then in that case, you don't care because you, you, your hard disk is encrypted. So you just lose the same, you break it, and that's it. And there's no need for recovery of the data or tra tracing the data and so on and so forth. And uh, you can see again, um, so I don't want to go much into technical details unless you ask for, but Basically, before full disk encryption, you would have like a parallel tail distribution with an outlier regime of these extreme events. When, when a laptop or, so, or a mobile phone would be stolen, then it would just take enormous amount of time. But after full disk encryption, you get this outlier regime disappear, and then you get a, you revert to a normal parallel, normal let's say normal, uh, not so extreme parallel distribution. Very nice. This is a very nice example of a decision that probably has been taken collectively by the by the management and implemented by some technical people say, okay, now we're going to encrypt all disks. And this has reduced drastically the, the risk of having a, an extreme event uh, regarding um, a stolen devices. Um, so this is a very compelling example of how humans get equipped with technical 
means in order to achieve at scale um, a big impact for the positive uh, side. Now, we can also measure sort of like the baseline and the excess effort. I told you before that uh, over six, two point uh, six, over more than six years, that the, the, the effort of the sort of average median effort remained very stable. So actually, over six years, they did not double or triple the amount of, uh, of resources devoted to security. It remained like mainly stable. And this is nice. But you see also in red these decorations, like these spikes. And this is what, what is we call um, sort of instant effort or excess effort. So it means that you get on, on average the need for roughly two, a bit less than two uh, um, people uh, 24 hours a day to, to absorb the shocks. But at some points, over time, you get some, some, some events that are going to take uh, resources up to 100 times the, the baseline of the of the um, of that is needed. So actually, this tells a lot about like how you could organize a, um, um, uh, a design an organization. Say, or actually, we get a baseline team. They're going to absorb the shocks, they absorb the, the events, and then you get a, a spare or sort of like an emergency team that is capable of, like the example of the earth bleed uh, hack or uh, um, unity. They are just ready, like the firemen, to to intervene when needed for the highly technical or problematic issues. Do you have a question? Yeah, um, but I, I think you just geared it up. Men per hour means how many people were employed or working on that, on CyberSec in that particular hour. Yeah, exactly. This is, well, it's, it's men hour. So, um, of course, we don't have like the details of the payroll and how people were, but we could infer it from the data because we knew for each event how, ma how much time it take it took uh, uh, them to solve the issue and renew when, when the event started and when the event uh, would be finished, would be, would, be, um, would be cleared or resolved. And then you can just like sum up, make the integrate, the integrate, integrate over all the, all the events and find sort of like a timeline of how people were busy in, uh, on average. But isn't that problematic because you assume that um, um, events is being worked on continuously for the whole interval. Yeah, this is a limitation. We cannot do much about that. I mean, of course, uh, this graph should uh, should deserve some addition of seasonality. So, say people work during the day. Here, the assumption is actually that they are working 24 hours seven, which for this organization is not stupid. If you go to UBS, same same thing. A security operation center is certainly operating 24 hours a day. So maybe we can have a, a discussion whether there are maybe twice more people during the day compared to uh, during the night. Okay, maybe. But this doesn't change the picture fundamentally. No, no, no that's, that's not at all what I meant to criticize. So what was the, your criticism? Yeah, exactly what you said, that, um, that we are missing a bit of data that we yeah. don't know yeah. how much affected work went into. Absolutely. Into yeah, the we don't live in a perfect world, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> but if you have better data, I'm very interested. <laughs> so this is the, the distribution of the of the, the excess uh, in red, the excess effort. So you get, you can even say, okay, with what what is the chance that you get an event that is going to take you ten times or one hundred times the baseline work? And this is very nice for planning because you can say, okay, now I know that every one month or every two months I will get an I will get a, an event on average, an event of this excess effort, so you can plan accordingly. Okay, I'm going to, time is, well, it's passing extremely fast, so I should maybe just uh, accelerate. So I'm going to do this, this one. So the big thing is that here I want to, I'm going to also go very fast, is like, well, what counts is really learning and economies of scale. And the second thing is like, all people this technology provides leverage like an exoskeleton to learn to using and mastering technology and this is very genuine to the learning process. I'm going to jump on the, also on the limitations, but this is exactly what you say, that we don't have like a perfectly consistent uh, measure of efforts. So I'm going to go for the, the part, uh, uh, the second uh, uh, talk. You can again, if you want to scan the QR code, you can get access to the page for that. Um, so the second paper is, uh, uh, um, called Given Enough Eyeballs, All Bugs Are Shallow. And this is a, um, he was a very famous adage by the, one of the, the first proponent of open source software development, Eric Raymond. 
And uh, the question is like, okay, what does it hold? And how can we say whether this is true that if you get enough people look at the source code, the source code is going to be bug free. And actually there are two different uh, um, sort of like uh, opinions. One is the one of Eric Rehman, say, okay, look, I mean, everyone should get access to the code, it should be open, it's going to be a much better world uh, for everyone. Note that the Earth bleed, the Earth bleed attack on SSL, SSL is an open source uh, uh, protocol. The Earth bleed, uh, at, uh, exploit was on an open source, uh, very critical open source comp component so project, which did not prevent the fact that it was open, open source did not just like raise immunity by, by miracle. You still need people to get, to get interested in the code. And these people, um, Bradley and, and Ross Anderson, who is, uh, and Mr. Ball, uh, Ross Anderson is a guru at the University of Cambridge on, uh, on cybersecurity. They, is, uh, they are saying that actually finding bugs is a problem of, uh, max, uh, of entropy maximization. So you're going to always find uh, the least number of bugs necessary. You're never going to complete uh, a full scan of the, of the bugs on all software, no chance. And the reason is that like the bugs that get revealed when you change the environment, so there's kind of like a, a, a fitness issue. That, uh, and so the, the idea is that really, if you really want to scan for bugs, you need to look at the, to look at, need to look at the software from very, very different uh, direction and with different perspectives. And this is the, the, the idea of the hacker. The hacker is going to come with a different vision, different perspective uh, compared to the one who has developed the source code and this person is going to find some, some issues. Actually, um, so the data we're going to use for trying to understand the mechanism of uh, all people find out bugs or not um, is bug bounty programs. Uh, this is now something that is getting very, very popular. Only arriving now in Switzerland, the Swisscom has started their first bug, bug bounty program, program a few, few weeks ago, maybe a few months, but it started in 1998. Who knows who Donald Knut is? Who doesn't or who does? Hmm? What's the question? Who doesn't or who does? Uh, who does? Okay. Okay. Where? Okay. Not everyone. So uh, Donald Knall is a genius inventor. He's in so for those who are performing a, a PhD writing in LaTeX, he's the, by the way, uh, uh, one of the, the inventor of LaTeX, but he also worked out one of the first, uh, uh, oh no, it was, uh, yeah, he was like a genius inventor, but mainly he's known for LaTeX. And actually, he ran the first, uh, the first bug bounty program. He said, oh, if you find some bugs in my code, I'm going to give you a reward. And he would double the reward every, every year. And actually, he would, find some, he would just give, send some checks over time uh, repeatedly. Uh, these bug bounty programs, actually, it was very early days, but uh, other companies had adopted the same strategy. Netscape, Google, Facebook, and the Department of Defense in 2016. The idea is that well, you can get however number of uh, security analysts you get in your organization. You might still need some people outside. Refresh you on your, on your code that you can reward for their findings. So that's the reason why you can find a security researcher in, uh, in Gaza uh, with very little means capable of finding a major vulnerability in Facebook on a Facebook website. No problem. This exists. But this is, this is strange in some way. You say, like, oh, is it possible that one person is uh, like this with very little me li limited means can find a bug. But bug bounty programs look like crowdsourcing security, right? I mean, we're not just capable of doing that in house, so we're going to launch a crowdsourcing uh, campaign and try to find some, uh, some bugs. The problem is that like most crowdsourcing campaigns are actually very well defined in terms of problems and needs like needs a human brain power to solve the problem. But the problem of uh, software security and software bugs is that actually the problem is very ill-defined. We don't really know, it's not very well conditioned. And this raises a lot of, uh, of issues. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you another question, if you're okay. Um, sure, yeah. What does Netscape, Google, and Facebook have to do with the Department of Defense? But they all do run bug bounty programs, at least on this slide. Is it a fair answer? Oh, you want me to say that uh, the de Department of the, or the CIA is uh, having a venture capital uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, company that uh, is investing in all these companies? No? That is interesting too. Uh, yeah. 
No, but it's not. Want to ask this question, but anyway, no, no the, point I, the, the point I wanted to make here is that the Department of Defense, you, you really think of this organization as the most paranoid organization in the world. Why these people would open up to the crowd to find bugs, even if it's only on their website? I mean, this is just but incredible in a way. Yeah? So, but for the Department, for the Department of Defense, what, what bug? I mean, the, yeah. what bug is one bug of? Where is the bug from? My understanding is not on nuclear weapons. Uh, my understanding is really was on the on the website and some less critical issues. Yeah, I mean, if it's about like uh, launching uh, ballistic missiles, I'm not sure they are going to run a, a bug bounty program anytime. So. But still, I mean, this is a for. I mean, if you imagine military, they have like they have this. They have this mindset mindset of being paranoid, not sharing, keeping things for themselves. And suddenly you say, hey, now we're going to run a bug bounty program. What's in there for them? They get like unlimited resources. They can, they can draft people, they, could, they can enroll people to just to do the job. So why they should do that? I have no answer. I mean, they, know, they did not motivate on a white paper why they are running a, a, long, a, a bug bounty program. Yeah? I know we're running short on time, but what is your answer to professors if you say that it's an ill defined problem? Why, why not just run it? Closer, closer against the software and, and the bullets user. Yeah, I mean, that's another way, but apparently it's not sufficient to, to solve all the bugs either. Because you still have a, you st when you run the fuzzer, you still have a, 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 a sort of a, a way of using the software. And what we need in order to find bugs is to run the software with different perspectives in other ways, like out of, the, out of their normal environment. And this re really requires to, to think out of the box constantly. And if you if you code something and repeat it at scale, it's going to be extremely hard to explore all these different situations. But fuzzers actually are, are, are also part of the solution. Just that here we studied bug bounty programs. Um, so uh, the un uh, outstanding questions with bug bounty programs is really what are the mechanisms, what are the what are the incentives, uh, the royalty, windfall, bug abundance. Um, this is uh, this is uh, the um, well, yeah, whether we, we can actually exhaust the number of bugs that you can find in a, in, in a software. The answer is no, um, and I'm going to show you. Um, so the nice thing with bug bounty programs is you get the incentive mechanism that are associated. You can know how much people get paid for finding, for finding bugs, and this is great. And it's pu somehow publicly available. And what we found is that actually it pays super linearly to have uh, more researchers in the bug bounty program. So it means that the more people take part in a bug bounty program like security research the even more um, the even more uh, uh, bugs get found so this is just awesome this is cool it means that bug bounty programs work yeah what's the mechanism <laughs> well, just well i'm going to come to it yeah. <laughs> just so it means like one researcher is going to make one one unit uh, two researchers going to generate 2.4 units and so on and so forth but the thing is that like, there's a, st a strange thing that actually each researcher can find only a limited number of bugs in a given bug bounty program. So this is strange to say, okay, you would expect that some people, once you, know, once you get to know a bug bounty program, you get to, you, you get to be more, more potent in uh, finding bugs and you should just find more and more. Not true. I mean, there's a, it seems that there's a hard limit around uh, uh, 150. So why is it that people cannot just find more than 150 bugs in one program? So we're going to try to give an answer to that and to your question first. Is it an incentive problem? So you would say, oh, maybe they just at some point they just don't get enough money. Not true. The community reward per researcher per program is increasing, is sharply increasing. So it means that the, the more bugs, the even more money you are making in this bug bounty program. However, the marginal frequency of bug discovery decreases sharply. So it means that however money you get offered to find more bugs, at some point it's going to be extremely hard to find additional bugs. And this is, this is a pain. This is really bad. And this uh, tells us about like, how much we, can, we are capable of, um, as humans, uh, just finding some software bugs. So I'm going to jump very quickly on that, but it sounds like a, a, very close to a St. Petersburg paradox. I don't know if you've heard about this. The idea is that 
you get you get a probability that is decreasing extremely fast to get a, an increasingly fast uh, a reward. So it means that uh, um, you have a divergence between the reward and the frequency. And that's kind of the situation in which people, uh, security researchers, are stuck. They, they have a very hard time to make their mind about like, what well, is really worth making an investment because frequency is decreasing fast, but reward is extremely, uh, extremely, is getting large. So you go to the extremes in frequency and, and reward, and gets extremely hard. You just cannot make your mind. And uh, this is probably a situation that is close to the one of the security research. So the solution, and that's where we saw the thing, is that portfolio diversification. Actually, if you look at how people do, a, a considering multiple uh, bug bounty programs, if you accumulate the bug bounty program, I mean, the people, what they are going to do, the researchers, they are going to work a bit on a program and then to, on another program and so on and so forth. The amazing thing is that if you get one researcher finding 200 bugs in one program, you get a fresh res researcher come in. This person is going to find maybe another 20, uh, 200 bugs and so on and so forth. But the same person cannot do much more. So it means that, again, this story of perspectives. One person is going to do, they will reach a limit, but then you get a fresh person with other skills or with another perspective on, on life and on software development and on hacking this person is going to find other bugs. So that's the way the, the bug bounty programs uh, need to work. They have to really just uh, reshuffle and mix the, the competencies as much as possible. And that's what people do, actually. They do a, a bit, they go to another, another bug bounty program. So the thing is that like, uh, uh, well, I'm going to just uh, very go, uh, go faster on this, but the idea is that you get conflicting incentives and then decays of su a submission. Uh, it's not in the interest of a bug bounty program to lose, pro uh, to lose developers at first time, you would just say, uh, uh, researchers. So it means that at some, t at some point you just, you just don't, don't want to get them go. And uh, um, yeah, this has some, some implications for all the bug bounty programs are competing to each other. So I'm just going to go a bit faster. Um, so one uh, takeaway too uh, is like, what is the number of bugs found per research? Why is it limited? Uh, one explanation is really cognitive load. Actually, at some point we get stuck. We get framed in a way that it gets impossible, probably impossible to get out uh, what we have as a vision or understanding of the problem of the software. And this possible explanation, or the other one, it would be insufficient misplaced and misplaced incentive, but this is not clear. The, the empirical evidence doesn't show that. So, takeaway three, who was right, Raymond or Brady? Actually, both were right. I mean, uh, more you, Brady and I, more human effort leads to more bug discovery, but this effort must be heterogeneous. You need to have like different people look at this and test the software in a special environment each time to discover new bugs. And Raymond is like saying, even, I, even having any of eyeballs is critical, but it's not a sufficient condition to avoid all bugs. And that's, the, that's the, the, the conclusion of this. So I'm going to go for the part three. Um, any pressing question on the bug bounty programs? Yeah? Could you talk about the data? Because in the previous uh, article you talked a little bit more, I could imagine that if this is not, this is like a case study or... Yeah, I, I, so, this is sorry, really I, I went too fast. Actually, these are the data from HackerOne, which is the main bug bounty program platform. And it was, we studied 35 public programs and uh, on which the bounties were on average between 470 and 1,000 dollars. So these are data you can go and uh, scrap from HackerOne um, and just analyze the same. Actually, most of the data we have is on our GitHub repository, so if you want to use that, you can. So HackerOne is the main platform for bug bounties in the, in the world. So is, is it answering the question? Yeah. I mean, did you do anything in the context of establishing causal inference in that study? Because just scraping a website is not really... No, I, I don't know what you... There's no causality here. We're just uh, trying to, to, to crank out the mechanism, what is going on, and uh, the idea is not to make any prediction at this, uh, at this stage. It's just to observe uh, an ecosystem and try to, to uh, reverse engineer the incentives 
by, uh, in, by proxy evidence, uh, which uh, again is best effort. We don't send remarks as before, like it's not prime data. I mean, I think we live in a world with cybersecurity where it's very hard to say, hey, just give me all your data, it just people don't like. I mean, I cannot go to hacker one and say, hey, give me a dump of your database. Never, they would never do that just for, for security reasons. Yeah, you, there was a question? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, just out of curiosity, so you're basically assuming that there are always undiscovered bugs, right? Yeah. So, like, that seems old. So, I mean, like, if a lot of people cannot find bugs, it could be that there are no bugs. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, the two, the, the extreme, like the Ayatollah way, yeah. is like really, yeah, yeah, I mean, you can, as much as you look at, as people are looking for bugs, they're going to find bugs. Of course, if it's a if it's a piece of code with uh, with 25 lines, probably you might exhaust it. But I mean, if you look at like proper software, it amounts very quickly to, to thousands of lines. Uh, packages uh, um, uh, packages connected between each other, compatibility issues, all the, all those things evolving very quite rapidly. So you get always opportunities for bugs. I mean, uh, it's not, we, we don't live in a static world. Uh, an, a, a company like Facebook is probably changing 10 to 15 percent of their code every every year, maybe even more. They're they're even growing their, their code base. It's billions of codes of lines of codes. I mean, there's just enough space for that. Uh, yeah. But maybe you have another argument, right? I mean, but in principle, it's true if we think about it and we are like scientists and we are just uh, cranking out like a few a few hundreds of lines in our scripts and we think, oh, makes no sense, we can figure out all the bugs. But first, you, you might recognize that it's not easy to find out all the bugs in a, in, a, in, a, in a Python script. It's not even easy to find all the bugs in your paper you're writing. You write a paper and then you read, you proofread, you proofread twice, and still you get another paper, another person look at the paper would tell you, oh, I found six or ten typos. Okay, that's exactly the same mechanism that is at work. Okay, I'm going to try to go fast. So, I'm, this is opportunistic work in the sense that I got a, I came across a, a, someone who gave, he became a friend who was a PhD student at uh, Columbia University. And uh, actually, this person was uh, uh, studying the way people reverse engineer Bayesian networks, which is something very well known in, uh, in uh, cognitive science now because there are, you have these people in cognitive science that uh, tend to say that the human brain is should be working as a as a, a, a system of Bayesian inference i mean whether they're they right or not about like all oh, the brain is working this is like a major training in cognitive science and this person was studying that he had like set up all the, this world experiment where where the people the participants should look at uh, uh, try to reverse engineer Bayes, Bayesian network and find out all the joint probabilities of the Bayesian network I, when I read, uh, uh, when he told me about that, I started to laugh. I said, like, oh, if you have like a three-node Bayesian network for which you have to re to reverse engineer the weights and the joint probability, it should be super easy. But actually, it's extremely hard, and that's what we are going to talk about. So, actually, the reason why cognitive scientists are interested in these Bayesian networks and all people reverse engineer is that actually uh, society and uh, and cybersecurity actually. Facing hard problems, and we want to understand all these people. All people are facing these hard problems. And the nice thing with uh, Bayesian networks is that they are sufficiently abstract uh, to map sort of the problems of the of the modern the modern world. So it can be software development, it can be policy making. Think about like Merkel and Sarkozy trying to to crank out the, the, the financial crisis. Uh, um, it can be science actually. How do we crank out the big the big problems of science? So, this cognitive uh, science approach is really like you get some you get some uh, uh, Bayesian network that is uh, that is reflecting a situation a, a real world situation and you're asking people to just try to find out what what are the weights what are the joint probabilities of the Bayesian network. So this looks like this. This is the interface you get. Uh, so in that case, the person uh, Johannes uh, did not look at cybersecurity but was like trying to look at all people would understand what would be the relationship between export, production, unemployment, and interest rate, pretty much economics. Actually, extremely abstract to people in general. I mean, what, 
do you know what is this what are these conditional probabilities I don't so the people in the experiment they are just trying to find out how these links are made this uh, this joint of these conditional probabilities are uh, um, um, are made and they are trying to infer what is the true solution uh, from try and fail in a way or another so there are two treatments of uh, each 24 participants. One is a three node simple Bayesian network, uh, uh, and the second one is the complex, a four node complex uh, Bayesian network. So the first one has uh, the people, they have to do uh, eight joint probabilities, to reverse engineer eight joint probabilities, and uh, for the four nodes, it's uh, 16 joint probabilities. Seems easy, but actually, it's not. I mean, when you look at the the decay of the distance between what people are attempting in terms of uh, models and the distance to the true to the true uh, solution, the decay is extremely slow. Um, so um, it's again a power law decay. Um, Dirk might laugh about that because my advisor is a big fan of power laws everywhere. So it looks like I've been framed the same. And uh, but the idea is that you get a decay t uh, um, at the power minus. Uh, minus v and v being very small, 0.2. So on average, for the simple treatment, it would, it would take like roughly seven days to ensure that the distance between the module, between the true model and the, the model that people are trying, it would take seven days to find something with a difference of less than 10%. So just like for three or four nodes net network with, uh, with four, or eight or 16 probabilities, it's like a very, very hard. So you have high variance and ultra slow convergence. And uh, what is the, the search process that people are uh, uh, implementing in order to, to, to find out solutions? The nice thing is that this experiment was performed on the, on the web and we could, ex we could record every second of all the moves of the people. So what they would do or not do during the, during the experiment. The experiment was 40 minutes. And we have like the second resolution on the, on the reverse engine. So what we found is actually the displacement of uh, uh, when people just like go from one solution to another, this, this uh, displacement, this uh, power law distribution with, uh, um, uh, with an exponent, which is 0.4, and the waiting times between, between uh, two solutions is also a, a power law distribution with an exponent close, exponent, exponent close to, to 0.4, the same. And this actually, uh, looks like this, that would, would be over, uh, over time, you get some displacement, and then you get uh, some t, so some time, no change, and like a step function. And this is a continuous time random work, and that we can, we understand as uh, uh, when it's a memory-less process, we can understand all the, 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 the space, the solution space gets scanned by this displacement in the, in the, in the space. Um, so depending on the values of alpha the exponents, uh, alpha and beta, you get uh, uh, sub-diffusive or super-diffusive uh, processes. And uh, to just to give you a sense on a, on a 3D, on a 2D model on a plane, this is a typical normal Brownian motion, memoryless Brownian motion. And here's memoryless living flight. You see that because you have like these large displacements from, from time to time, and then like a small displacement all around, the, the probability that the, the particle or the, the search um, um, the search agent will just go back to the same place it was before is extremely is much lower with the lady flight, and this is really the reason why that ju the, what justifies the use of lady flights for, for search when you have like sol uh, sparse solutions in a large solution space, and. Um, the nice thing with that is that leaf flights and CTLW are used by nature, by bumblebees, by albatrosses, by spider monkeys. They've also been found in human mobility. Uh, that's nice. So we tend to go from home to work and we, we go around to the cafeteria and, so and sometimes we take a flight and we go uh, all, all, all over the world and then just going to move around and then go back and so on. So this has been found as, a, um, as a, also a pattern for human mobility. What is really nice also is that we know that hunter-gatherers or ancestors also use 
uh, these lily flies. So they're going to go from one food, stop, uh, food spot to another, food site to another, stay at, around the food spot, and just uh, go jump to another one, and so on and so forth. Everything is not understood about that, but uh, but this is uh, this seems to be like a very hard uh, uh, hard coded uh, way of searching solutions of food, which is kind of the same. Um, with the cognition, memory retrieval seems to be operating exactly the same. So actually, we tend to be when we are looking for words, we're going to search around with like small variations of one word, and then maybe go to another word completely different and so on and so forth. And it's also used for on online auction. It seems that humans are also using that for online auction games. And this is uh, some work from uh, uh, Radici and uh, also uh, uh, another guy I met. I don't remember his name. Uh, uh, okay, anyway. And uh, this seems to be also used this way. Now the problem is that the diffusion uh, in the case of human search in, uh, for Bayesian network, it's like it's ultra slow and sub uh, sub diffusive process. So it means that there is something strange that humans they are using what is uh, what seems to be a daily flight, which seems to be optimal or very good for for search of uh, of uh, solutions that are very sparse in a large solution space. But at the same time, they are not really they seem to be not using the maximum potential. So actually they are not diffusive as much as they, they should. So there is, there, there is something that is missing. And uh, we try to understand that what, what is going on. You get the, the assumption with lady flights is you get a memoryless process. But actually humans are not memoryless. They are just doing things uh, which are path dependent. They are really based on memory. And this we will see in the, in the remain, uh, remaining slide can be tricky, can raise some problems for solving, solving hard problems. So what we looked at first is really say, okay, we, uh, we make a partition of the solution space, which is like eight dimensions and uh, with each value ranging from zero to one. And we try to look at whether people go back to solutions they've already explored. And the answer is yes. They tend to return uh, several times. Uh, they tend to return several times to the, to the same solution. And then even some solutions, they would go to up to 50, back 50 times. And, uh, and we know it's completely inefficient. You, you've explored a solution, and there's no reason why you should return to it. You just want to search uh, even more the, the solution space with new solutions and so on and so forth. And we also looked at the visit to new sites from this partition, and we found that it's sublinear. So it means that with time, the number of visits is uh, of new sites, of uh, new solutions, uh, is going to, to marginally decrease. Not good, not good at all. And uh, we want to understand that a bit more. And we know also that this capacity to visit new sites is directly um, uh, related, correlated, dependent on the, on, the on the performance. So it means that we know that these people who are um, uh, capable of visiting new sites are actually those who are going to perform best in the end. So, what can be the what can be the, the possible moves? Um, actually, there are three. Uh, one is what we say: it's like you get a um, you get a sort of like a, so, a convex, convex power of the, the solution space you have already explored, and the, the, the dots are the places you have already explored. And the first one is say, okay, I'm just going to return to a place I've already visited. Uh, the second one is say, okay, I'm going to make a recombination of the, the solutions I've already already tested. And the third one is like, oh, I'm going to try to do something out of the boundaries. I'm going to try to explore something that is, um, in, in a way, somehow it's related to what has been already explored, but also something completely new. So we made a, a sort of a ratio of... Uh, we call exploit explore ratio, and uh, that determines if a solution uh, uh, J uh, goes beyond the convex of, of already explored solution space. Um, if this uh, this ratio is uh, smaller than one, you have an exploitative solution, recombination of existing solutions. If the if this ratio goes above one, it's an exploitative solution. It means that it's exploring new things. And we try to look at uh, what is 
when, when is it going to, what are the circumstances or the, the situations where the gain is the best? So the delta distance here, uh, when it gets negative, it's a, a really good. It means that we are converging towards the, the true solution. And we found that we can actually see that there's a maximum, there's a, an area of uh, the displacement that is actually the best for, for improving performance. But uh, we also see that around the same area, it's also the time, the, 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 this, this area where the, 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 the time to, uh, to take a decision, the waiting time before you take a decision to move is going to start, to start picking up. So there's a trade-off. You're going to make a higher gain, but it's going to take you much more time to take a, to take, take a decision. And of course, you get only 40 minutes. So you get a trade-off, a compromise to make, and it's a question of optimization over time, over in the time critical situation. We looked at also what is the, the ratio of explore to exploit, the, uh, the EE ratio as a function of uh, displacement. And we find that actually, of course, the larger the displacement, the more likely you're going to be in a situation where you're exploring. And then finally, we try to see uh, what is the relationship between the, the performance and uh, this ratio. And this is less clear, but it seems that actually you need to be always a bit beyond the, the convex hull of the, the already the, the existing solution space to to make some some significant prog uh, progress. So uh, it's a wrap up for hard problems here. Uh, there's a tautology. I mean, solving hard problems is actually hard for humans, and this is this is a, a pity in a way, but we have to understand. What are our limitations? And this has implications, of course, for cyberspace. But uh, the the main takeaway is that there is a tendency for humans to return to previously visited site. And I want to give you an intuition of what's that. You're working on a hard problem, and at some point you say, "Oh, you're not converging to something really new. You're going to return to a solution that you've already explored." Maybe there's a safe spot, maybe there's something that just makes you comfortable with that, but you know it's not going to bring you anything new in some way, but you're just getting back to it. And it's like, oh, maybe I'm going to try a new thing, and then you go back. And then you, but this we know is not really, is not really efficient. Um, um, and there are memory, uh, there are memory issue actually. We return, or we're not really, we are just recombining, or we're not really exploring enough. And there are trade-offs that we don't really uh, understand yet. So this paper is a work in progress. For instance, we are interested in a, a next steps is to understand recency, its capacity to, of people to forget about solutions they have explored or not, and whether it's uh, leading to, to performance or not. These two things tend to undermine performance for sure. So there is a concept in cognition called the cognitive load. And this seems to refer very much to this. The idea is that at some point we get loaded, we get framed in a, in a situation that it gets really hard to get out. And this has, uh, this has actually, um, uh, uh, um, I would say, uh, implications. So for instance, the story of the bug bounty programs where one, one security researcher cannot find, faces a hard limit on finding new bugs, get framed, get cognitive load, it's impossible in a way to, to get out of this. And um, these results are actually, uh, there was a paper by uh, Baron Kelly and Radici saying that actually supporting the idea that we get hardwired in this situation it means that we have like, we have accumulated uh, uh, generations of, uh, of uh, sort of like a genetic traits or traits on how we are dealing with, uh, with uh, solving problems. It looks like it goes directly back to the hunter gatherers but the question is like, are we still like looking for food in the savanna, or are we in a new era when where uh, problems are abstract and uh, need to rethink the way we are solving the solving problems? And uh, the question is, uh, can we do it at all? Maybe we just get hardwired. It's impossible to to go beyond this limit. So conclusion is uh, last slide. I think we we are almost on time actually. So the. Uh, the idea is that the, we get these two case studies from cybersecurity risk, and both involve challenges in learning and cognition. Especially the second one, this limitation in capacity to find capabilities to find new bugs, is just astounding. 
And there are probably many, many, many more, more instances uh, uh, where of cyber risk which involve cognitive limitations, like the privacy paradox. We all know that we have to, we all know we have to, to be careful of our data, our personal data. Still, we are not doing that. Misaligned incentive, intern time, intern time uh, choice dependencies. That's one. There are many others. Um, um, and there is one in-depth study of human, of all human tackle hard abstract problems. It seems that there is really a cognitive load issue, and it's not reassuring at all for the for the future of cybersecurity. Um, we are living in an epoch of unprecedented, complex, and time-critical cyber social technical challenges, and human cognition may be the very next next frontier. Why I'm tell telling that time critical is the following: you get some vulnerabilities now that appear. Ten minutes later, you get uh, cyber criminals starting to exploit them. Um, and the, these attacks, these exploits can be critical, can be on WordPress. I don't know if anyone is running a, um, a WordPress blog, blog or, or website. It's very, very fashionable. So in May, uh, last, so a few months ago, there was an exploit discovered. And on Twitter, 10 minutes later, the first attacks were, were, were started. So the question is not whether we are going to solve the problem, is whether we will have time to solve the problem. And the experiment I showed uh, with this colleague, Johannes, from, from Columbia University, is exactly the situation where we are asking people to, to try to find a solution as fast as possible uh, in a, in a time-critical manner. And the results, again, are not really reassuring in terms of what we can achieve as humans. So with this, um, I'm done. I'm very happy to take questions. Uh, I admit the results might be controversial, and so I'm very happy if we have a discussion about them. I don't know if we have time, actually. Uh, yeah, a few minutes, I guess. Um, so first of all, I think uh, Thomas uh, deserves some applause. <laughs> yeah, that was an interesting talk full of information. And uh, we've learned how important collective intelligence is when it comes to complex problems and that cybersecurity has to do with complexity and that different perspectives are needed uh, in order to solve the problem as for any complex problem I would say. And I liked very much actually this approach that linked to resilience because I often say Remember that quote of Benjamin Franklin, who said, uh, who trades off security with freedom will finally lose both. If we just have a security perspective, with uh, one perspective only, basically, then we'll see threats everywhere and uh, we'll basically do all sorts of things that I think ultimately lead into a totalitarian society. The resilience approach, however, I think really the more important approach is cyber resilience. Resilient approach would imply diversity, different perspectives, you know, and uh, also decentralization, uh, backup solutions and all these kind of things. Uh, so it's something quite different but much more suited for complex systems. If you treat a complex systems like a sim single system, a simple system where one perspective and things like optimization can be easily applied, then you would um, easily run into trouble because your solution approach is not appropriate. And there's a lot of talking about cybersecurity, but it's mostly military thinking and not complexity thinking and that concerns me and I hope you got really that message that um, you, you have to think from several perspectives and you have to take into account the complexity of that challenge. Can yes. I add something? Sure. <coughs> I got in touch with um, uh, the cyber security underwriter of a main uh, reinsurance company in France, not Swiss Re. Score. Actually, they also have their office in, uh, in Grise, uh, Grison K. Um, and the guy told me, uh, told me, look, 
we have a problem in, uh, with the cybersecurity community. They are monoculture. Actually, because they are engineers, we are all engineers, I have an engineering degree, but you know, we have to also have, take some perspective about ourselves. Like, because you get all these computer science engineers specialized in security in a security operation center, this is bad. This is bad because people get framed into something they, they feel comfortable about. They get, they get to have like an analytical view of, uh, of what is security and they want to make plans. They want to, they want to build their security in a way that makes them comfortable. And, uh, and he said, this is the major threat uh, for any company. If, the guy said, if I would, uh, I would be the chief risk officer of an organization, or if, I, if an organization wants to underwrite cyber insurance from, from SCORE, they will need to have economists, social science, psych psychologists, all kinds of different people in their security operations center. And the point he said is that actually, it's not that the people in security are not competent, it's just that they are just building a library tower uh, in which they feel comfortable and resilience is not about like being comfortable. It's about like always going a bit beyond a comfort zone to just to make sure that you get, you get uh, uh, this shock absorption capability. So that's a uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, lesson taken from the industry. This is the point, this shock absorption capability. But what you have described, this interdisciplinary approach that uh, is being called for, this is actually at the heart of the peace room concept that we described in one of our nature correspondences. So, you know, classically there is this war room concept. When there is a problem, you build a war room that collects all sorts of information and then you have a military style decision making process. Um, and in our piece published in Nature, then we say this is not the best you can do. This is also not appropriate. You need to have a multi-perspective approach. You need to have an interdisciplinary approach. You need to have a participatory approach. And Facebook had to learn a lesson when they were trying to solve the fake news problem. They said, okay, now we're going to apply a huge digital filter, basically, uh, AI that is intelligent enough to identify specifics of fake news, kind of particular words, for example, um, that look like conspiracy theories and um, all sorts of things. Also, maybe the spreading speed of news because it seems like fake news is tendentially spreading faster than truth. And these kind of things can be used to define features. Right? And they had to figure out that their super duper AI system failed to contain fake news. And what then Mark Zuckerberg did at one press conference, he said, we're going to link subjects to Wikipedia. And there was not even enough time to inform Wikipedia beforehand about it. You know, everyone was surprised. And what that basically means is he had to admit AI is not a solution to the problem. Collective intelligence is. I mean, at least it seems to be superior because that is the principle behind Wikipedia, right? And so if he had to admit our AI is not powerful enough, even though they probably have quite sophisticated AI system, pretty advanced among the leading AI, solutions in the world, I would guess. And he has to admit it's not working. We need to link to Wikipedia and that tells us something. Now, but the very same guy, Mark Zuckerberg, has recently announced, hey, we have created a war room for the midterm elections, basically to defend against uh, fake news and manipulation, all these kind of things. Now, he didn't understand what he was saying. It's again this one perspective approach that uh, seems to be behind it rather than really going towards the peace room approach, right, which is much more multi-perspective, integrated, interdisciplinary, and so on. So I, I hope you will be coming up with better solutions. Uh, ETH students are of course known to be uh, very smart. 
and also our institution is committed to interdisciplinarity and that's also why we have guests that mean this department so thanks for joining in are there any further questions or comments no then i hope you and there was one. okay um, regarding the interdisciplinarity mm -hmm. what what makes interdisciplinarity in this case i mean it's, uh, i i have difficulty with that term you mean for cyber security yeah taking a social scientist look at cyber security what was yeah, yeah. but I can jump on what Dio just said. He's uh, actually he made a conclusion I did not dare making in my talk. Uh, you get this thing that uh, individuals are hardware, they, get, they, they suffer this cognitive load, and it's not sure at all whether we can fix that because it goes back to hunter gatherers like generations ago. So, the question is like, okay, either we fix it or maybe it's not possible, or we find a workaround, and maybe the workaround is really going to collective intelligence so it means that okay i acknowledge that i have a limited um, cognitive capability i have a limited brain and my capacity to to serve problems or to solve problems is bound to my environment and where i've lived and my life experience and my and uh, and maybe iq and so on and so forth you got another person different thing and that's when these people with different views different uh, uh, different i uh, would say on capabilities that they, they learn from, the, from the, their environment, when they get together, they're going to be able to triangulate sort of the problem in a more efficient way. Of course, there's a cost to bear, it means that you are a computer scientist or talking to a st like this stupid, boring social scientist, that, that's a pain. So the point is like, oh, can we make people understand that they are better off making the effort of talking with people that they are not used to talk to, to in order to get something that is the world is more than the sum of its parts. Of course it's not granted and uh, the first I was be, yeah, why do we need a social scientist in cybersecurity? But actually because social engineering is the first cause of cybersecurity incidents in the in, in computer systems. It starts with that psychology. You want to be a good a good security officer or a good hacker actually start by reading how to manipulate the mind of people. Coding is like completely, completely sec mm -hmm. it's not secondary, but look, the most important thing is all you trick people into, into opening an email they should not open. That's where it starts. Yeah, so that, that is exactly the point. So even if, if the police um, and, and military, they, they suffer of this problem that they have thousands of people, each of them has an email account. You know, a certain percentage of these emails is kind of faulty. I mean, there is um, some software in there, a link or maybe an attachment that looks like a picture or like a Word document and you click it and there's some extra functionality that basically pollutes your computer and uh, installs a turn horse or whatever, you know. This is happening to all those institutions, including the, the high security institutions because people are part of the problem, those people who are using those systems, right? But I have a hypothesis regarding this, um, you know, getting hardwired. I think that's probably not only a problem of humans. It, it takes a very long time actually to learn. And the more things that are out there to learn, that have to be understood according to different principles, the higher will your convergence time be. But you know, at some point in time, the ma machine learning or brain learning is made in such a way that there will be eventually convergence, if, if it's possible at all. Of course, there are kind of learning problems where you probably would not be able to establish convergence at all. But let's, let's assume that we construct it in a way and also machine learning would be constructed in a way that there would be eventual convergence to more correct, more or less correct solution. And if it's a complex learning problem, it really takes a long time, you know, and you know how long we humans have to learn. Like um, we go to school 12, 13 years and we uh, study for five, six years, we do a PhD and so on. So it takes a long time. Now, 
I wonder what happens if you would build a super intelligent system that is as smart as all the people in this room or all the people in Switzerland, you know, just hypothetically, you know, what would be the convergence time? And also, how much will the world have been uh, changed by the time that huge learning algorithm has converged? I think that is actually the, the issue. The, the bigger is the, the learning problem that you have to solve, the longer is convergence time, but our world is changing much more quickly. And that's why distributed intelligence probably has an advantage over super intelligence in a quickly changing world. That's my, my hunch, but you know, you sit down and uh, come up with a mathematical proof for that. So. <laughs> All right? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, you know. I'll just make uh, one comment for you, one question, and this is about an interdisciplinary approach. Uh, a nice presentation, I think, but also maybe you should, maybe next time also, there are like a few good studies regarding like different systems, like Debian and different like Windows and stuff, and with respect to their vulnerabilities, and why certain systems are like more prone uh, or less prone to this. And one good example, like, why you need some interdisciplinary approach currently is like considering that the most complex software written is the worm that was like uh, that was for a few years spreading around the world and then at the end ended up in the Iranian nuclear power plant. So in a reason to do this, you know, and then people were analyzing how it was written and then actually who read uh, for you know, this kind of trick to, to be possible you actually need uh, a lot of different approaches. I'm not suggesting <laughs> that you need to develop like a different group uh, mm -hmm. in order to make worms, but I'm just saying like that uh, why sometimes interdisciplinary approach can lead to completely different uh, solutions. Yeah, I think the problem was that I, I wanted to ask about your particular research and not about the, the operational consequences or the, the, the decisions that come from your research. I mean, of course, your research indicates very clearly that you should work in interdisciplinary teams, that you should take different perspectives and so on. Uh, what I meant was really your research. I, I thought the interdisciplinarity related to the approach of uh, looking at cyber security, which mm. I saw as simply being social science. So you mean the, the research approach? Yeah. That's well, this is a very nice point you're making here. I mean, I'm. 1995 to 99% of the research in cybersecurity is about technology. Uh, means uh, you go to, I don't know, I graduated from EPFL or you go to ETH to same. 95% of the of the budgets for cybersecurity goes to protocols. And uh, now it's no problem with that. I mean, but then you go uh, again, you. You go talk to a chief information security officer, the guy says, boy, my problem is psychology. So you get a, miss, a huge mismatch between what are the needs of the industry um, and uh, what, what, what is being uh, researched and taught in the, in the, in the, in the, in, at school. And this is a big problem because then you get to be into a sort of kind of a filter bubble where exactly as Dirk said, people cannot envision any other thing than technology to solve the problems. So I'm, I'm, a, techno I'm a techno optimistic, I just love technology, I'm a geek like you probably. But the point is, this is not sufficient anymore. We, when, when the internet was a, was a small thing for geek, uh, like at CERN, at Stanford, maybe a bit at ETH Zurich too, um, at the time, no? Uh, 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 that was fine, but now the, the digital, digital, the internet is everywhere, is in people's life. You get, this, uh, you get this, uh, these loudspeakers, microphones at home that are recording everything and so on. You get really, I mean, no one can really say that uh, technology is not permeating into society. So now it's a problem of society, it's no longer a problem for just engineers. And this is maybe the issue uh, where the, all the research and all the teaching is still in the plain engineering way, where it should have shifted to, should have shifted to say, hey, look, you have a, you are an engineer, you are coding some 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 protocol, you have a social responsibility for what you are doing. I'm a civil engineer by by education, not a computer scientist. 
You know, when you build a tunnel, when you plan a tunnel, when you plan a bridge, you have to make all kinds of assessments for environmental impact, social impact, economic impact. How much of this is done in, co in computer science? Zero, like zero, or very little. So I'm sorry, we are in a situation where there's a big, big thing. And people keep talking about like, oh yeah, AI is going to solve the world. No, AI is just a, a tool that in some cases is very useful, and in many other cases it's just like crap, and that's it. And so I'm sorry to say that this way. Um, well, also the danger is, of course, that decision makers, um, both in politics and business, are being misled about this, you know, and that investments are not made the right way. Uh, of course, companies want to sell products, kind of software that claims to make your computer secure, and you install it, and you're fine, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. apparently. After all that Thomas has said, this, this approach falls short, but I think it's also danger, dangerously misleading our society about what needs to be done to live in a well-working, positive future. You're a bit like, a, you know, a, a software uh, security is a bit like uh, in finance, you know, okay, or we are selling you this pension fund and uh, okay, well, you know, you look at the last 10 years, it's just growing or it's fine, so it's going to continue this way. Though there's this uh, very little markdown down the page say that uh, the past is not predicting the future. <laughs> then you get this collapse. But the nice thing is that they come up with a new product, say, hey, look, this one is going to save all your problems. And then you continue like this because you have no other choice, basically. And I think uh, software security, software vendors are kind of the same. They're like for years, they would sell ant antiviruses Everyone knew that it's uh, just marginally useful. Now everyone recognizes that and say, okay, no problem. We have other things to sell to you, and that's fine. We build up a new product. Okay, what is the trust we should have in this industry? And they're just like systematically misleading. And the point they are saying is like, actually they are, they are, they are, they are pushing people for um, consuming security in a way that is not long-term sustainable. They're just saying, hey, just buy this, it's going to be cheap. You get this appliance in your, in your network, it's going to solve all your problems. Now, everyone knows it's never, never going to work, but you get still these people tricked like, uh, like, uh, like bees uh, going to honey. And uh, So, okay, I'm a bit, here I'm, I'm getting a bit um, sarcastic and, and caricatural, but there's something in there. And the problem is probably that that exactly this lack of research, this lack of teaching that actually security is no longer a problem of just building protocols or hacking protocols. It's mm -hmm. a problem for society, it's a problem with implications for cyber bullying, for, for many things. And this is not, this is not addressed in uh, engineering school. So yeah. I don't know, maybe you have a reaction to that. Let, let me just If get... we have time, huh? I would love to say something. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, I'm, I'm in environmental sciences, and particularly in environmental governance, and uh, for me it sounds extremely obvious that you would have to have heterogeneous perspectives and that you would have to have some, um, some aspects of democracy maybe in, in, in development patterns in, in the way that funds are allocated, etc. Et so to me it doesn't it's not astounding at all, and, and, and maybe that's why yeah. why we uh, spoke past one another. But thank you for the explanation. Yeah. So I'd like to thank you for all the patience. Just I'd like to mention one thing that uh, came across my uh, career, basically when I got in touch with artificial intelligence and the people who were running this. Uh, somebody from a big IT company who was pretty much involved in all of those programs and knew what was possible with that kind of technology and what was not. And he told me there are two things we can't solve with artificial intelligence. And one is climate change and one is cyber security. But the very same company, they're trying to sell AI solutions to politicians in the world also on those subjects that they should know it's not going to work, this is not the appropriate approach. So, you know, you, you students of ETH and, and later thought leaders of our society and business world, you need to be critical and basically identify where 
we are being tricked and where a solution is sound. So I'm certainly not speaking up against using AI. I think it can be useful for many problems, but we need to be able to figure out what are the problems where it doesn't work and not pretend it would. All right, so thanks very much, Thomas. Thank you.